he will talk about uh, dual antiplatelet guidelines and implication therapy. Please, Dr. Tariq. Okay, well, next. Abalish? All right. Dr. Tariq, you have two, 20 minutes. Dr. Tariq al are you here? I'm here. Bas I'm going to the timer. All right, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee and the scientific committee for organizing such a beautiful event, the first uh, PCI Middle East. And of course, to thank uh, uh, our industry companies for their continuing support in our education. I will talk about DAPT in ACS. Hello, just a brief introduction. The term acute coronary syndrome is applied to patients in whom there is a suspicion or confirmation, of course, of acute myocardial ischemia or infarction. Of course, it constitutes three uh, categories, ST elevation MI, non-ST elevation MI, and unstable angina. This is a um, diagram from the New England Medical Journal. We all have seen it. That represents the different uh, mechanism and pathophysiology of uh, ST elevation and non-ST elevation MI and unstable angina. Approximately one person in the U.S. has a myocardial infarction every 40 seconds, and more than one million coronary events occur each year, of which one-third are recurrent events. So, antiplatelet medications and strategies to lower levels of LDL are cornerstone therapies to reduce recurrent atherothrombotic events after an ACS. So, some of the current controversies in DAPT. We, some of the questions always rise. Which drug to use? When to start? Which dose? And I think the biggest controversy to all cardiologists is how long to continue that. Hello. In Greek mythology, Scylla was a ferocious beast, and Charybdis was a monstrous whirlpool. They were located in two sides in Italy, on two sides of Italy, one on each coast. The wily Odysseus was a hero there. He was trying to get back to his home country. So, because the beasts are found on each uh, coast. So what did he choose? He said he chose navigating between these two drugs by steering closer to Scylla, though he did lose a few crew members to her. So he decided to go to the Scylla, and he lost few members compared to the other monster. In a similar manner, the astute clinician managing myocardial ischemia by using antiplatelet therapy attempts to balance coronary thrombosis, the basic cause of myocardial ischemia, against hemorrhage, the most feared complication of antiplatelet therapy. There are many pathways by which antiplatelet drugs may antagonize platelet activation or aggregation all of which increase the risk of bleeding, and many of which decrease the risk of ischemic events. Of course, so this is basically, we have to balance between dual antiplatelet therapy regarding the decreasing the risk of thrombosis and decreasing the risk of bleeding, which any clinician always tries to balance. Of course, we all know about aspirin as a foundation of antiplatelet therapy and has proved its efficacy in secondary prevention and, of course, more modest benefit in primary prevention in higher risk subgroups. Even aspirin, as compared with placebo, is associated with an excess of hemorrhage, predominantly GI and rarely intracranial. And this was shown last year in two studies regarding aspirin in primary prevention. After aspirin, we have the intravenous glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors, which inhibit platelet aggregation by blocking the platelet glycoprotein 2B3A receptor, were validated as a useful addition to aspirin, particularly in patients with ACS who are undergoing PCI. Especially large benefits were noted in patients with diabetes who are known to have heightened platelet reactivity. Back in the early 2000s, when I was a resident and then a fellow, we used to use 2B3A inhibitors in every single case. And now, actually, the use has decreased a lot. Next in the evolution of antiplatelet therapy came adenosine diphosphate receptor antagonists, which inhibit both platelet activation and aggregation. Initially, ticlopidine, in combination with aspirin, helped facilitate the widespread use of coronary stents by decreasing the risk of stent thrombosis. 
with an acceptable bleeding profile as compared with that of more complex antithrombotic regimens which had included warfarin. Of course, ticlopidine has a major, had a major side effect which is leukopenia and after ticlopidine came clopidigrel which was found to be safer than ticlopidine and, and at least as efficacious and allowed for the testing and ultimate validation of DAPT with aspirin plus clopidigrel as compared with aspirin alone across the full spectrum of ACS. The major trial that showed that dual antiplatelet therapy regarding clopidigrel was of course a CURE trial which decreased the primary composite endpoint was less at 12 points uh, between, of course, aspirin and clopidigrel con compared to aspirin and placebo. And then a major breakthrough trial was the PC, the CRADO, which this validated the, uh, the use of DAPT for 12 months uh, in initially with bare metal stent in ACS patients. Of course, the CURE trial was also another trial called the PCI uh, CURE trial. All right, so since the advent of dual oral antiplatelet therapy for ACS with the clopidigrel having an incremental benefit over aspirin in reducing the incidence of recurrent thrombosis or myocardial infarction, an avalanche of research has culminated in the emergence of the faster acting and more potent and consistent antiplatelet drugs, which are ticagrelor and prasugrel. This is a diagram showing the, the many, many studies uh, we have seen in cardiology regarding the prasugrel, which came, uh, the trial, the major trial was Triton TM38, which came out in 2007, and regarding the trial of Ticagilor, the, which was the Plato, which came out in 2009, and these two trials were game changer in the, using the uh, DAPT in, in compared to clopidigrel. Now, basically, DAPT in non-ST elevation acute ACS. The following represents a sequential approach to the use of antiplatelet agents in patients presenting with non-ST elevation MI or unstable angina. Of course, all patients should receive aspirin, usually dose 162 to 325. The first tablet should be chewed. All patients should receive a P2Y2 inhibitor. Which agent depends on the course of action, whether we are, we are treating the patient ischemia-guided strategy or invasive strategy. Because if we are gonna use invasive strategy, we do recommend using ticagrelor over prasugrel, and uh, I'm sorry, we can use either ticagrelor or prasugrel in the uh, invasive uh, therapy. The, ischemia, the conservative, the ischemia-guided, we can only use ticagrelor. Of course, the loading dose 180. Because prasugrel wasn't studied to be given upfront in the ER, uh, because we have to give it after the coronary anatomy is known. Most patients do not require an intravenous glycoprotein 2B inhibitors. Indications for this class of antiplatelet drugs include maybe patients with ongoing ischemia, despite therapy with aspirin plus P2Y2 inhibitor, or, as we have seen in the previous case, high features during angiography, such as large thrombus burden or intraprocedural thrombotic complication, uh, particularly if they haven't received prasugrel or tegagrel up front. Taban, patients re should receive PPI inhibitors. DAPT and STEMI, we give aspirin, command loading dose 162 to 325 as soon as possible. This can be given either in the ER or en route on, in, the, in the ambulance. Once the reperfusion re strategy, whether PCI or fibrinolysis or no reperfusion uh, re has been chosen, a P2Y2 inhibitor should be given to all patients. For patients receiving PCI, we prefer either ticagrelor or prasugrel over clopidigrel. For patients receiving fibrinolysis, we prefer clopidigrel because it wasn't, others weren't studied. And for those receiving no reperfusion therapy, we prefer ticagrelor. So PCI, we do prefer ticagrelor or prasugrel. For patients receiving fibrinolysis therapy, we prefer clopidigrel, and both those receiving no reperfusion therapy, we prefer ticagrelor. Of course, we, we, we don't use 2B3 inhibitors anymore, unless some in the previous indications we have, I have alluded, like slope, reperfusion, or giant thrombus.
Now, regarding the guidelines, these are the ACC AHA guidelines regarding DAP therapy. Regarding the specific, specific, uh, specific P2, Y2 inhibitors, the guidelines do recommend that it's reasonable to choose ticagrelor over clopidogrel for, uh, uh, as a drug. Also, they do recommend and uh, using prasugrel over ticagrelor, and of course, prasugrel should not be administered to patients with a prior history of stroke or TIA. So the guidelines, both the American guidelines and the ESC guidelines, do uh, uh, say that it's reasonable to use ticagrelor or prasugrel over clopidogrel. Aspirin, they do recommend as a dose, which is a baby aspirin, either 81 in America, 75 in Europe, or 100 here in our area, we do use 100 milligrams. Before we go to ACS, I'm not sure how, um, how is, is, if you can see it, regarding DAPT, in stable ischemic heart disease, we can see that now the American guidelines, after a bare metal stent, recommend DAPT for two, only four weeks. This is in stable ischemic heart disease. After DAS, they do recommend only for six months, okay, in stable ischemic heart disease. We can use it uh, after DS more than six months. It's a class 2B indication. We'll talk about that in a second. This is stable ischemic heart disease. Now, regarding ACS, the duration with therapy in medical therapy alone, it's basically 12 months. That's the guidelines do emphasize that between the European and the American guidelines, at least 12 months. And of course, as I, as I alluded, if it's uh, medical therapy alone, uh, and patients uh, present with ACS, they do recommend ticagrelor uh, as the first choice, either uh, clopidogrel or ticagrelor or medical therapy. Aspirin dose is 81. In patients who uh, did not receive fibrinolysis, we can use only clopidogrel. Now, fibrinolytic therapy, as I said, we can use clopidogrel, and the dose is 81 in fibrinolytic therapy. Medical therapy alone, as I said, they do recommend, or the guidelines say, you can use ticagrelor or prasugrel over clopidogrel. Now, duration, which is the biggest controversy in, in all cardiologists. Again, the class one evidence is to use DAP therapy for 12 months, aspirin dose, baby aspirin, 81 or 75 or 100, and they do emphasize Again, it's reasonable to use ticagrelor in preference to, to clopidogrel for maintenance of P2Y2 inhibitor therapy, and it's reasonable to use prasugrel over, uh, over clopidogrel. Of course, the patient should be having had a stroke or TIA before. Hala, duration continued to be. In patients with ACS treated with coronary stent implantation who have tolerated DAPT without bleeding complication and who are not at high risk of bleeding, continuation of DAPT for 12 months may be reasonable. This is a 2B in indication, all right? Um, the major studies that were studied regarding prolongation of DAPT, we have the Pegasus study for Ticagrelor, the DAPT trial, Charisma trial. These three major trials that studied the continue adapt more than 12 months, all right? And the guidelines conclude, both the European and the American, that it's a 2B indication to use prolonged DAPT more than 12 months. And the European guidelines do say that after 12 months, the dose of ticagrelor should be 60, not 90, after 12 months, based on the Pegasus trial. Again, prasugrel should not be administered to patients with a prior history of stroke or TIA. Also, again, in patients, sometimes we do, we do forget, all of us forget, sometimes after a cabbage, if patient had an ACS and had a cabbage, also DAPT should be continued for 12 months. Doesn't mean that if you didn't have a stent, that we shouldn't use DAPT. Also, after cabbage, a patient should continue DAPT for 12 months. This is 
this summarize from the guidelines summarizes the duration. We can see the green ones, all class one indication to continue that for 12 months. After 12 months, it's a 2B indication based on the three major trials as I've alluded, is the Charisma trial, the DAB trial, and the Pegasus trial. And if a patient has high risk bleeding, after six months, we can stop the DAB. Again, it's a 2B indication. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to show a figure from uh, Jack Interventions by these authors, which was published in May, summarizes, this is very nice, whom we can choose the adapt, uh, prolong, prolonged DAP, more than 12 months. In the, law, in the box, patients, I believe, who should receive DAP are the high ischemic risk and low bleeding risk. This consider extended DAP more than 12 months. Who are the high-risk patients? They are defined, we have uh, from the guidelines, from American guidelines and the European uh, ESC guidelines. This is our from the American guidelines. I'm gonna actually talk first about the ESC guidelines because actually um, they summarize who are the high-risk features of stent-driven recurrent ischemic events. I would choose prolonged DAPT in these patients. Prior stent thrombosis and adequate antiplatelet therapy Stenting of the last remaining patent coronary artery, diffuse multivessel disease, especially in diabetic patients, chronic kidney disease, at least three stents implanted, at least three lesions treated, bifurcation with two stents implanted, total stent length more than 60 millimeters, and treatment of CTO. These are high risk features. Of course, they should also have low bleeding risk. I would suggest prolonged DAPT more than 12 months, up to sometimes 36 months to, for DAPT. The American guidelines are more or, same, more or less the same, but we have, they do emphasize who are at decreased risk of bleeding, like the history of prior bleeding, patients on oral anticoagulant therapy, female sex, advanced age, low body weight, chronic kidney disease, and diabetes. And, and this, I conclude my presentation, and thank you again.